Welcome to Applied Mathematical Finance. Yeah, we started now um, a section on the discrete term structure model. So our intention is now to model the whole interest rate curve, discretized because we will consider here discrete forward rates. So our simple forward rates, yeah, but in a certain sense, that's okay, because in the computer, maybe we have to discretize anyway. And also on the market, yeah, there are not so many financial instruments that we can observe to say calibrate the model. Yeah? So maybe to have a discretized uh, interest rate curve, yeah, it's not such a big issue. And if you put this aside, then this is really now, the big model that will allow us to value, yeah, almost all interest rate derivatives, say as long as they are just based on interest rates, not mixed with other assets, like for example, equity and interest rate mixed. We can of course extend this model to a hybrid model. This will be the basis. And um, also that we are still in one currency, so it's not mixed with other currencies. Really, this model could be then be the starting point of extensions. Yeah. Maybe to make this remark, um, our numerea could be, for example, this rolling bond reinvestment. So that is uh, invest in the zero copper bond that matures at the end of the next period. So that was this little M of T, yeah, that is the period start where the little T is sitting inside. Then plus one, it's the end of the period. So always invest in this guy. And then of course, over time you accumulate some investments. So I'm starting here from say zero to M of T and I have accumulated investing in this forward rate from TJ to TJ plus one fixed at the beginning of the period TJ multiplied with the period length. So if this is, for example, our numerea, yeah, we have now a very general model for the numerea because we will model all these objects here. If we have the numerea, we can observe all zero copper bond prices, at least on our time discretization. So maybe we cannot observe them for all little t. Um, and to some extent, this is then the foundation where you could put other model on top. Yeah? You could model um, a stock with a Black Schultz model on top of a stochastic numerea, you know, which would be an equity hybrid model. You could model now a foreign currency interest rate on top of this domestic currency numerea as a domestic investor, which would be a cross currency hybrid model. So this model is yeah, very powerful if we focus on interest rate derivatives and it's the starting point for extending the model to also other asset classes classes if you consider a stochastic numerea our model is defined in terms of eto stochastic processes of course that's also a way where you can then generalize the model yeah to move to other stochastic processes, Levy processes, to add the stochastic volatility here or whatever. So we have that DL is mu I dt plus sigma I dw. Sigma I written here as a local volatility function, but what we will do today also holds for the stochastic volatility model. And our model parameters, so we have here the model, our model parameters are the initial value, the volatility function, and the correlation of the Brownian drivers of the risk. I already mentioned that we could state an alternative formulation. Yeah, you 
fusing together volatility and correlation to the factor loadings, yeah, which are the Trulesky decomposition of the covariance matrix. And so in, in this case, I have as a model parameter, the initial value and these factor loadings. <clears throat> so where the factor loadings lambda are associated with the sigma i and via this f i also with the o i j. What's missing is that we need to specify the model under the equivalent martingale measure. So we are here under P. That means that I still have here the drift under the objective measure. And what I like to do now is discuss the derivation of the drift. So we will move to the section derivation of the drift. I will derive the drift from Ito's lemma. Yeah, this is maybe a bit uh, uh, tedious calculation we have to do. But um, an important aspect in my lecture is that I would like to give you a very good intuition for what is going on in this model and how, for example, the model relates to other models, to short rate models, and also to see yeah, where are defects of this model? Because that's really very important if you work in industry with such a model to understand what are the limitations of the model and so on. And the funny thing is that when we derive here the drift and we investigate a little bit the drift, there is also a part where we can gain a deeper understanding of the model by looking at how this drift term looks like. Okay, so what I like to do is I like to derive the drift. So the question is, what is the mu j under the equivalent martingale measure, qn, superscript n? Well, for a given choice of a numeraire. So that's also something that is coming up now that is special. So while we had this model before, for example, when we looked at the valuation for a caplet, you know, then, okay, with a sigma here, you know, just a constant, it is the Bachelier model with a sigma times L here, it is the black model, black Schultz model. You know, okay, so we already had this model, but just for a single forward rate, for example, it was T1 to T2, yeah, just a single forward rate. And there was the special choice of enumerators, for example, such that this drift became zero and things became easy. So for every forward rate, there was a special choice of numeraire that things become easy and we know the distribution. The problem now is that we have to choose a single numeraire for all the forward rates LJ. So maybe I can choose the numeraire such that one forward rate is a martingale, but all the other guys will very likely not be martingales. Okay, so that's the complicated thing. I observe now all these forward rates under a single common numeraire, and the choice of the numeraire, so that's here my n, will then also determine which measure we are using. Yeah? So if we use the numeraire to be the bond that matures at the final time, yeah? so at my time horizon, so I have a time discretization, say from T0 to, and so on, the final time. If we choose that guy, that's called the terminal measure. Um, you could also consider our rolling bond reinvestment, the guy that I wrote before. Okay, those that's the P T M T plus one. So always invest in the zero cobra bond that matures at the end of the period. Of course, this numeraire accumulates then some interest 
Okay, and the TK forward measure yeah, is also um, a special choice of Numerea. Yeah? It's actually a mixture of the two. Okay, so let's start by deriving the drift under these measures, and then we will investigate a little bit how the drift looks like. Yeah, our program is like we did it before. So as we did, for example, for uh, the caplet or the quantum caplet. So our first step is to choose some numeria and then derive the drift of our stochastic process under the equivalent martingale measure. Okay, and how do we do this? Okay, so we know that traded assets on the market divided by the numeria are martingales. So once we have that, okay, so we know how the process looks under QN, then we have our universal valuation theorem that we can value all kinds of financial derivatives yeah, numerically now by using the property that also the financial derivative divided by the numeria is now um, a market martingale. So the program is that we have to look at n relative prices. And these n relative prices are martingales. I like to determine the mu i, the drift for the i's forward rate. I like to determine this for all i. So we have to some extent n unknown objects here. No? Okay, actually they depend on time and they are stochastic processes on their own, yeah? but okay, just think of it as a variable. We have n unknown objects. Actually the forward rate L0 is already fixed, yeah, but that doesn't matter. That's just where our starting time is. So to some extent, I need n conditions to determine these. Yeah, so n now being here the little n. So the condition is that a traded asset divided by num my numerea is um, a martingale. So what traded assets do we know? No? Do we know some traded assets and do we know n different traded assets? Yeah, of course we know if this is our time discretization. This is the final time. This is here the starting time. Okay, we have a tenor discretization, T1, T2, and so on. We know the zero copper bonds that pay one unit at this time. Okay, so I know n different financial products. For the terminal measure, I now choose the numerator to be one of these zero copper bonds. So terminal measure means that we choose as numerator the zero copper bond that matures at the end of my time discretization. Yeah, why is this a nice choice? Because the product exists over the whole time until I have reached the end of my time discretization. So the end of my time horizon. So that's the nice thing. If I would choose a zero copper bond that would pay one unit of currency, say in TK, that product would be equal to one if little t reaches the maturity, yeah, TK in my in my example. And after that, the product no longer exists. So I have to describe what happens to the numeraire after that time. Okay, this problem is not occurring here. So Maybe this is then a very nice uh, numeria yeah, for my model. You could also think that this is maybe the most popular numeria yeah, because it is quite uh, natural, but this is not the case. Yeah. The numeria has a few things that are not so nice. For example, whenever you extend your model, so you would like to increase the time horizon, uh, you have to actually change the numeria and the whole model changes. Yeah. It is maybe nicer to have a model that just runs on, which will be then our 
next choice of a, of a numeraire or other alternative, the spot measure. So from Gesanov theorem, I know that uh, yeah, doing the change of measure is a change of drift. So instead of determine what is the measure, we determine how does the stochastic process look under that measure. Okay, so that's much easier. And uh, our condition is that I know that all the Zurich-Kruber bonds divided by my numeraire are martingales. Yeah? So the question I have is what is mu j under this numeraire? Okay, and the trick that I'm using is that I know that P Ti divided by Ptn is a Q Ptn martingale. So this is the drift of the forward rate. This is a stochastic process for which I know it is a zero dt plus some dw. So somehow I have to get to an equation that determines here the drift. But these guys here are functions of the forward rate. And if I have a stochastic process that is a function of some other stochastic process, yeah, that's Ito's lemma. I write down the function so what is PTI divided by my numeraire? Yeah? So I know that this guy is a martingale. So I know it is uh, some stochastic process. So I know applying the differential to this is a zero dt plus a something dw. Yeah? So dw now being, for example, the vector yeah, consisting of all of my brown in increments. Yeah, and I know that I can represent this as a telescope product. So it's the product PTK divided by PTK plus one, yeah, period start divided by period end, running from I, K equals I, which is the first one, to n minus one, such that here the last one is n minus one plus one, the tn. Okay, and this object there is just by definition, so that was our definition of the forward rate, one plus lk delta k. So I use here the notation lk as usual, is my forward rate from Tk to Tk plus one. And my delta k is the period length. So that's my Tk plus one minus Tk. Okay, so I know that this stochastic process here has drift zero. Okay, so I know that these guys are PTN relative prices, so they have zero, zero drift, yeah? So we know that this drift is zero. What I will do now, I apply Ito's lemma, yeah? So this is here my function of L that's describing the martingales. Now I will apply Ito's lemma to this function. So the next step is apply Ito's lemma. So what is the differential of the product k from i to n minus 1, 1 plus delta k, lk. So you see I need the product rule. I have to differentiate a product. So let's copy maybe the product rule here on top. So we have that the product of x and y uh, differentiated gives me two first order terms. So that's y dx plus x d 
dy plus a second order term dx dy. So if you differentiate now such a product here of multiple stochastic processes, so this is differentiating the product of x, j, where my, or x, k, where my x, k is here, this one plus delta k, l, k. Then this means like in this rule here, for the first order terms, you differentiate one element of the product and the remaining elements stand as a factor in front. Okay, so this means if you mark, say, the factor that stands in front here with blue and the guy that is differentiated here with green, okay, then you always have differentiate one element of the product, say, for example, they are the x and the remaining elements of the product stand in front, and then sum up you know, doing this for all factors. Yeah, So I have also here differentiate the other element of the product, the y, and multiply with the remaining part of the product. So you could write down the product rule you know, immediately for differentiating, say, a product k from i to n minus one. Yeah, so let's use here the same indexing. Yeah, Okay, it is, you have the product in front, okay, where one guy is missing. So this is here not equal to j. So that's the product xk. Okay, and then you have the guy that is differentiated outside the dxj. And this is done for all the elements, okay? So that's now the sum over all j. This is for the first order term. For the second order term, maybe not so visible here, it is differentiate one guy out of from the product, differentiate another guy, not being the same one because that's already been differentiated out of the product and have all the other guys in front. So let me add the second order term here to our generalized product rule. It's differentiate two guys. So I have an I. Oh no, an I is maybe not, not okay because that's already used. So let's say I have a, what do I use there? Okay, J and L. So I have a J, I to N minus one. And I have an L from i to n minus one, but L is not equal to J because that guy is already differentiated. So all the other guys stay in front. K from i to n minus one. K not equal J, K not equal L. Now these guys have been differentiated, so they are the remaining parts are the x case. And then I have the dx, j, d, x, l. Okay, so that's below here the generalized, generalized product rule. Okay, and that's the situation which we have here. So the blue part is the stuff that is the remaining part of the product, this guy. And then we have the inner derivative. So differentiate this thing here, differentiating one plus delta K L K is just the inner derivative. It is my delta J D L J. And I apply this differential to all factors to all J. Okay, so that's the first order term in my product rule. Then I have the second order term. Okay, so I have the blue part here, which you maybe do not see in this product rule. Okay, and the green part is then differentiate 
inside, so get the inner derivative twice as a second order term for two different indices. Okay, so that's two times here, the inner derivative, that's uh, delta j dlj delta l dll multiplied in front with the product. We have now two factors are missing. Yeah, Two factors are missing. And of course, this is done for all the combinations. So we sum over all factors that we differentiate. Also, maybe I made a small mistake here. You see that this sum here runs only over L being larger than J, yeah. So of course the second order term here is yeah, you 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 differentiate one guy out of the product and then the next guy. So it is actually one half if you take all combinations, dx, dy, and dy dx. Yeah? So it's one half. Or it's just take the the upper triangle part of the of the matrix. Yeah. So take for example L larger than j, yeah? So here below, take care, this is just L larger than j. So either you know the product rule by plus one half and then all combinations of L not equal j, yeah? because then you have also the, the term one half dx dy plus one half dy dx, but that's the same, yeah? Or it is, uh, you write it in, in, in this, this form, yeah? So maybe just, Note that there is a subtle thing here that L is larger than J. So now um, <clears throat> I uh, know that on the left-hand side, okay, so there is on the left-hand side, this guy is equal to some zero dt plus something. So I would like to work out uh, the dt part. You know? So you see inside here, there is already the mu j dt. Yeah? So we will compare coefficients and then we get equations for the mu j. It's always the same program like that. And we just have to work a little bit. So now I make a few clever steps to transform this expression. Yeah? And we are done in two slides. So the first step is that Okay, let's just add, let's just add back the element k equals j to the product, yeah? So if you add back k equals j to the product, I have a factor too much. So I divide here by one plus delta j lj. Okay, and we can do the same trick here. So let's add back k equals j element and k equals l element to the product. So let's get rid of this here. Okay, so what have I, I done wrong? So I have added a factor one plus delta j lj. So I just divide by these two factors here. And the other guy is one plus delta l ll. So what I have is that now the product runs from k equals i to n minus one in front of all these guys here. So the nice thing is that when once we have done this, okay, then this here is independent of the j and I can move it in front of the sum and the same happens here. Yeah, so I can move this in front of the sum. So the nice thing is that I have now the, this product part here in front and yeah, what we have from that modification is that I always divide here by one plus delta j lj. Yeah, the factor that we have differentiated in all these guys. Okay, so what I have done now in the first step from here to there, okay, is that I could move the product in front. And why is this nice? Yeah, this is nice because I will later compare coefficient to a zero dt. So this means I can I, I can just drop this product, yeah, because this product does not change that I have on the left hand side a zero dt, because all the differentials are now here in inside. 
So the next simplification is that we observe that that this sum here is also contained in this double sum. Okay, so in the double sum, I was running over all J and then I was running over all L for L being larger than J. So I can move one part of this double sum. So this double sum here is actually the sum over all J and then the sum over all L. Yeah? So actually L larger than j to n minus one. So I can move this sum in front of the two such that I have just here the sum j from one to n minus one. And then it's this plus this inner sum of the second order terms. So I have that the drift of this object here, yeah, the drift, so the coefficient in front of the dt is zero. So I have that the drift of this object here, the coefficient in front of the dt is zero. This factor doesn't matter for this condition. So I have that the drift of this object here, the coefficient in front of the dt has to be zero. So this means that, okay, I have a sum yeah, this means that the sum of the drifts is zero, okay? So I can move the sum that was previously here inside, I can move it in front, yeah? The sum of the coefficients that are in front of the dt of these guys here are zero. Now observe that we have this for all i. So I have this for all all i. Why, why do I have this for all i? Because I have it for all zero copper bonds, pti divided by ptn. Now plug in all the values for i. If I label this here, say, okay, this depends on j. You see the label I'm running over is the j. If I label this as, say, a J. Then if we use i equal to n minus one, you see this is a sum that runs from j equals n minus one to n minus one. I have that my a n minus one, there's just one element in my n in my sum, has drift zero. So I have that the drift of a n minus one is zero. Then I can use i equals n minus two. So then this is the sum j equals n minus two plus j equals n minus one. So I have that the drift a n minus two plus the drift, so the coefficient in front of the the key part, a n minus one is zero. So from that, I have that the drift of n minus two, a n minus two is zero. So you can go backward induction from j equals n minus one to zero to have that the drift of all these guys is zero for all j. Okay, so now I have that this holds for all j. So the sum that was here in front no, is gone. So I have that the drift of all these parts is zero. Okay, so now I'm always almost there yeah? because you see there is here, if we now make a comparing of coefficient, yeah? so I know that this stochastic process that is here inside is a zero dt plus some dw. Here we have the mu j dt and here I have a dj times dl yeah a dj times dl dj times dl is dt dt is zero dt dw is zero so only the dw dw parts count in for generating a dt part so this gives me a sigma j dwj 
multiplied with a sigma L dWL, this gives me a sigma J sigma L by our assumption, model assumption, rho JL dt. So I have here the instantaneous covariance times times dt. So now I can solve this equation. Yeah, maybe for other mu. So what I have is I have my mu j dt multiplied with delta j divided by one plus delta j lj. Then I have here my sum. So this sum over all the L terms, L being larger than J, so L being larger equal J plus one, L runs to N minus one. So this is here my, my sum that remained from the previous covariance from the previous second order term. So I have my sigma J part multiplied with this stuff here, yeah, the delta J divided by one plus delta J L J and my sigma L part multiplied here with the delta L divided by one plus delta L. Yeah, and the correlation part, which comes from the DW DW. Okay, and this is a zero dt yeah, on the left-hand side. So this has to be zero. This is the coefficient in front of the dt here inside yeah, of this uh, stochastic process. So I have that this is equal to zero. You see that this factor here is occurring in front of the mu. And it's also occurring here inside the sum for all the guys. So you can cancel it. Yeah, so you have just the mu here, you move this to the other side with a minus and we have the drift. The drift is minus the sum over all forward rates L larger or equal J plus one, the guy that we are looking at. And then the instantaneous covariances to the forward rate of which we like to calculate the drift of which we observe here, the drift. So if you would like to have a small picture, what's going on here? So this is our numerea. Our numerea is here the, the bond that sits in the last time point, right? So this here is the forward rate which we are observing. So the forward rate which we are observing is the one from Tj to Tj plus one. Okay, so I'm looking at the drift of this forward rate. Okay. And the drift is minus, okay, and then I have the covariances, the instantaneous covariances of this forward rate and yeah, all the forward rates that come after that, yeah, L is larger or equal J plus one. So it's the forward rate L J plus one, yeah, so L is equal to J plus one, which means the forward rate from Tj plus one to Tj plus two. So it's the guy that comes here. Okay, so I have the covariance terms of that forward rate with all the forward rates that come after up to uh, L equals N minus one. So up to the period from T N minus one to T N up to the last period. Yeah? So these are here the covariance terms we observe. Yeah? It is the covariance, instantaneous covariance between the forward rate that we are looking at and the guys that come after up to the point where the numeria is. And you also see that if the J is equal to the N minus one, that means I move here towards 
the final period, I'm sitting here. Okay, there's nothing after. Okay, it means that this sum here is empty. Okay, and that was also here the subtle reason that I wrote L has to be larger or equal J plus one and smaller or equal N minus one simultaneously because then you see that this is an empty set. The sum is empty. So this means that we have mu J, so mu N minus one is indeed equal to zero. So you see the last guy here. So this guy that resides here is indeed a martingale. Yeah, that was the derivation of the drift. So I have a negative drift and yeah, the drift is also becoming more negative uh, the further I'm away from this uh, point where my numeraire sits. You see, there is a connection to our session on convexity adjustment uh, when you pay at a different point. Uh, but now actually the numeraire sits further in the future it is further away, so the drift is here. My convexity adjustment is now negative. Let's do the same thing again for the spot measure. Maybe I go through this a bit, little bit quicker. Uh, so spot measure means I choose as a numeraire. Now our rolling bond investment. So the important thing is that you always invest in the bond that matures at the end of the next period. So I have my time discretization, my tenor discretization. So we start here, you know, say in T0. Okay. So T1, T2, T3 and so on. Okay, and my numeraire at say this time here, so this is here my little t, so my numeraire which I observe in little t, is that I start with initial value one, and I invest in the zero copper bond that matures at the end of the period. So what I have at the end of the period is one divided by the zero copper bond that matured at the end of the period observed at the beginning of the period, Yeah, because I start with one. So in the end, I have one divided by the value of the zero copper bond at the beginning. So this means I accumulate over time here our forward rates. So let's make them green again, yeah, always fixed at the beginning of the period. I accumulate them. Okay. And since I start with one, the expression is that I accumulate also already here. So I know what I have there and I multiply this now with the value of the zero copper bond which is smaller than one you know, if interest rates are positive to obtain this value that was our um, rolled over one period numeraire yeah, our rolling bond investment and recall from that session that this is a very similar object to what you have in the black schultz model the e to the r uh, T, yeah, no Maria. Okay, so program is again the same. I like to determine the drift. So let's look at traded assets divided by my no Maria. So there is here my no Maria, and I have now a traded asset, my zero copper bond PTI for different eyes. Dividing by the numeraire means I divide by the bond that pays one unit at the end of the next period. So as we did before, this at the end of the next period is encoded by defining M of little t. M of little t is here, okay, in this picture, the index three. Yeah, So it's the period start. So this would be my M of little t. So m of little t plus one is the end of the period in which little t resides. Yeah, I divide by my numeraire. I also divide by all the stuff that I have accumulated so far. 
Yeah. So this stuff which I have accumulated so far is already fixed, yeah, because that's the green stuff that I have already fixed in the previous picture. So I can maybe write this here. Yeah? So this is the stuff I have accumulated so far because it is just a constant. Yeah? It's already fixed. If I will then apply the differential to this and check that this is a zero dt, so then this constant here doesn't matter. Yeah? So it's just a factor which I can uh, leave out. So the question is, what's that guy here? So what's that guy here? So you see the bond that matures at the end of the period where my little t resides in. So say this guy is my little t. So this is my P T M T plus one. Yeah, this is sitting here. This is now a bond that matures earlier than maybe some T I, my P T I. Okay, so I have that something that matures later divided by something that matures earlier. So inside I have all the forward rates from J equals MT plus one to I minus one, yeah? So J equals MT plus one is here the starting point. I minus one is the end point. And I have all the forward rates, but now yeah, since this ratio here is the later guy divided by the starting guy, yeah, it's one divided by the forward rate, one divided by one plus LJ delta J. Yeah? So one plus LJ delta J usually is the bond at the beginning divided by the bond at the end. Here it's just one divided by. So the drift of this object is zero. So this here is just a constant. This is just a factor. So the drift of this guy is zero. Yeah, now apply Itros Lemma again. Yeah, this is my function of the forward rate. I have on the left-hand side a zero dt. I can compare coefficients. For this, I now need my product rule again. So I need my product rule that is a dx times y because I'm differentiating a product. Yeah, so maybe I just write the product rule for two factors here to remind you a little bit. So this is a dx dy. But I also have in an inner derivative now a one divided by. So I also need the rule what is differentiate one divided by x. Yeah, So maybe you remember this, this is minus yeah, because you differentiate the one divided by minus one divided by x squared dx. And then you have a plus because there is the second order term also here from Ito's lemma. It is a one divided by x to the power of three dx dx. So there will suddenly be here a, a term dx dx popping up. So something like a correlation to itself. So um, we need this guy. So let's put it here as a reminder and differentiate now this term, the product one divided by one plus delta K um, LK. So we have the same thing from the product rule. I have the first order terms where the product stands just in front with one um, factor differentiated. And then I have the inner derivative, okay, of the first order term. So that's now my inner derivative. That's my, of for the first order term. But now since the factor that I'm differentiating is a one divided by something, I get these two terms here. So this is the first part from 
differentiating one divided by one plus delta k l k. Okay, it is one divided by one plus delta j l j squared multiplied with the dx and also with a minus. Okay, so this gives me this guy. And then I also have the one divided by one plus delta j lj to the power of three. Yeah? And I have a second order term, uh, dlj dlj, yeah? And multiplied with delta j squared. Okay, these two guys pop up now because we have the one divided by uh, under the product. Then I have the second order terms. Yeah, my second order terms. These are now this guy here. So it's, again, the product stands just in front. Differentiate all the factors, differentiate two factors, yeah, two factors that are not the same. Uh, take the sum over all these. So differentiate the second order term, the inner derivative of the second order term is this part here. Uh, so this part corresponds to my dx dy. And for all these, the inner derivative is again coming here from my differentiate the one divided by so the one divided by x square part and the one divided by x to the power of three part for both guys here. Wow, that looks a lot more complicated. Funny thing is that we can simplify it and get almost the same um, expression. So because you see that I have here a square and if I remove just this square and replace it with a one. And if I remove this power of three here and replace it with a two, then I have moved one factor, one divided by one plus delta j lj to the front. So it means that I can Im include in this sum the factor k equals j. And the same here for the second order part. Yeah? So I can make this guy here a one, this guy a two, if I have that the k is allowed to be equal to j, then I have this, move this factor here in this product. And I can make the same for the L. I can make this a one and this a two. So I can get rid of this here. And you see now the product in front again, does not depend on the j. So I can move the product in front of the sums. So I can move the product in front of the sums. So now by this move, we have the product here in front of the sums. And what do we have inside? Well, inside there are now many guys yeah, multiplied here. There is the nice thing, there is a DLJ here. This guy will contain the mu J, which we are looking for. There is a DJ times D, a DLJ times DLJ, which will be a sigma J squared DT. Okay, that's okay. And what I have here, there is a DLJ multiplied with a DLL, a correlation term, but there's also a DLJ, DLJ multiplied with a DLL. Uh, so if you combine these guys here, you have DLJ, DLJ, DLL. Okay, that's a DW, 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 or a DT, DW, DW, that's always a zero. Yeah? So the same is if you multiply this guy with that guy, yeah? you have four differentials. If you multiply this guy with that guy, it goes away if you multiply this guy with that guy. So you see that actually this here will not enter in generating a coefficient for our dt part. Yeah? So we can use 
this little information here that whenever I observe here three or more differentials that these guys are zero. So the stuff here in the bracket is simplifying. So I have that guy, I have that guy, this guy multiplied with this guy. Okay, so one, two, and this multiplied with this guy, three. So one, two, three. Yeah, these are the three parts from the previous slide. And now you see that this sum here is the product of DLJ with an DLL. And that guy that came from differentiating the one divided by X in the first order term is actually just DLJ with DLJ. So I can move this part here into the sum. If you also consider the case where L equals J. No? So when L equals J, then this here is the DLJ DLJ multiplied with delta J squared divided by one plus delta J LJ squared. Okay, that's exactly this guy. So I can move this guy inside the sum if I allow here this. Okay, now the same two steps. Yeah, um, For the drift, this part here is not relevant. So the factor in front for the drift is not relevant. So I have that the drift of the sum is zero. So this means the sum of the drifts is zero. So these drifts here is zero. Okay, now you can do forward induction. I have this for all i. Yeah from mt plus one to the final time horizon for all uh, zero copper bonds that come after. So I can use now i equals mt plus one and see that the drift of this expression with j equals mt plus one is zero and so on. So I have that the drift of this expression here is zero for all j from m t plus one to the final time. So we have this for all the guys. So you know that the dt part of this is zero. So now plug in your stochastic processes. So your stochastic processes. So this here is a, uh, sorry, this here is a mu j dt. And again, dj, D, uh, dlj, dll gives me the covariance term. So such that we have that my mu j multiplied with this factor here. So there is a, a minus in front um, is plus the sum L from MT plus one you know, to uh, J uh, over these covariance terms is zero. So move the mu to the other side. Yeah, so I have a minus here. The minus came from, uh, it, uh, from this one divided by, okay. So I'll move the mu to the other side and you see that the mu is equal to this sum, which looks exactly the same as the previous sum, as the other measure, except that now there is no minus here, there is a plus, okay? Maybe maybe let's go back to the other guy, you know? so remember now how the drift looks here. This is the drift for the forward rate J, yeah? So now I have the sum from MT to j okay so how does this look 
let's draw a picture similar to the one we had before. So I'm looking at the forward rate from Tj to Tj plus one. Okay, the forward rate is not yet fixed. So my time, little t, sits here. My m, my m of little t is the period start of the period where my time is sitting in. So this here is t m t plus one. Okay, and I now have the covariance terms coming from, okay, L should be larger than T M uh, than MT. So actually the L is starting in MT plus one. So I have the covariance terms of the periods that start after the period where my current time is in. So you see, this is here my sigma L rho J L, the covariance between the rate I'm looking at and the previous rate. In the other picture, it was the rates after that rate, but the numeraire was sitting. Yeah, it was sitting after. Uh, it, it, it was sitting at the final. It was sitting at the final time point. Yeah? So now it's the rates before, but my numeraire is also a little bit sitting here. So the numeraire is the guy that has accrued interest over the previous periods. So like that and back to there. Yeah. Okay. So there's my my numeraire. Uh, but also note that the point L equals J is included. So there is also the covariance of Lj to itself. Yeah? So there is the sigma J squared term inside. So there's also this guy here inside. Okay, so compare this picture to here our picture for the terminal measure, okay, it was the covariance terms that came after, up to the time point where the numeraire resides, but not that one included. Yeah, L was larger or equal J plus one. Now I have the covariance terms that come before, including the rate that we are looking at. Another guy is the TK forward measure. So what happens if I choose as a numeraire the zero copper bond that matures here in TK, where my time horizon is here? So yeah, then you have a small problem because the numeraire does not exist after the point TK. So I somehow have to define what is happening after the point TK. And what I do is I go a little bit hybrid. Yeah, I have the terminal measure here up to TK and I have the spot measure here. So once I arrived with one unit in TK, I do the reinvestment in my rolling bond. So let's consider this little bit mixture of a numeraire. So I have a terminal measure on the first part. And then I have a spot measure on the second part. So after t equals tk, I go to the spot measure. Exercise derive the drift. Yeah under this numeraire and what will you see? Okay, so here's the solution. We have, of course, the terminal measure drift if we are before TK. And if we look at the forward rates that are before TK minus one. 
Yeah? So the forward rates that start yeah, uh, in one uh, time point before the uh, period. So that's here consistent with our derivation of say the terminal measure. We have also the drift of the spot measure for all the forward rates that are after TK when little t is after TK. Yeah, so that's uh, clear. So the situation is that here is TK, here is TK minus one. So once my time point is after that point TK, I switch to spot measure. And of course I would observe for all the forward rates that are here, I would observe my spot measure drift. If I'm before TK, I have somewhat a terminal measure that ends in TK. So for all the forward rates before, I would observe a spot, uh, a terminal measure drift. This guy here, my LK minus one, yeah, the period from TK minus one to TK, this guy is a martingale. So I already know that the drift of this guy is zero. The only missing thing is what we did not derive is what is the drift of a forward rate that lies here in the future, so after TK. So this is a forward rate that lies here after, after TK. When the numerea is the zero copper bond that matures here, so this here is my zero copper bond. Okay, so somehow, yeah, like the terminal measure, but now the zero copper bond lies before the forward rate which I observe. This derivation is exactly like in the uh, spot measure because the thing that you have to look at is this object occurs inside. Okay, there is the zero copper bond here. Say this here is Tj plus one. Okay, then you look at P Tj plus one divided by Ptk. Okay, and this is a product one divided by one plus L L. Yeah, the forward rate. So you will get. Uh, like here in the derivation of the spot measure, you know, the same product structure. So you also have the same drift term for this. Yeah? So it's very simple to derive this and you see the starting points are then the K and the J, yeah? this K here and this J, yeah? the rate from J to J plus one is the last rate in this product. Yeah, I also uh, started with saying that I want to give you um, a little bit intuition and there comes now an interesting point. Um, if you look at this slide here and just consider this case where my time little t is maybe somewhere here before. Yeah? So assume that little t is maybe here. So this means I'm in this region here where little t is before the gk. Then you have the fact that the drift is negative. Yeah, so assume that my correlation is positive, my volatility coefficients are positive. Yeah, so in this here is positive. So then my drift is negative for all forward rates that lie before the numerator, and the drift is positive for all the forward rates that lie after my numeria. Only one forward rate has drift zero. So my LK minus one has drift zero. By the way, this is completely consistent with what we had for the convexity adjustment. So look what happens if you consider the forward rate 
of that period here. So this is my LK, but you consider it under the numerea PTK. This is exactly what we had for the LIBOR in arrears. So this is this, sorry, this is this guy here for J equals K. And you see there is a term sigma J squared popping up. Let's go back. Forward rate in arrears was the guy that had as a numerea the bond that corresponding to the beginning of the period. And we had a convexity adjustment. So we had a drift popping up. That was exactly the sigma i squared. So you see that these drifts are actually the convexity adjustments that come now from the fact that the numerea resides at a certain point and the interest rate has a certain distance to this point, this time point, yeah, the maturity or the periods of the interest rate have a certain distance to this time point. And we get a negative drift if we are before, a positive drift if we are after. And our LIBOR in arrears was actually a guy that was just one time step after. So it was actually uh, this guy here that was 4j equals to k, one, one step after the guy that had uh, zero, um, zero drift. If you consider now the case where all the volatilities, the sigma parameters are the same, no, that's not so unreasonable. Yeah? So consider that we have a constant volatility, 20%, whatever. The correlation is one. Then you see that this term here is just a sigma squared. All the sigmas are the same. Correlation is one, a sigma squared. And you see that I'm integrating this sigma squared multiplied with time over all maturities. So it's like a little bit like an integral yeah, from the time where the forward rate starts to the time where the numerea sits, like an integral sigma squared dt. Okay, So actually the sigma squared is uh, a sigma sigma rho. No, and you are just integrating over the other part. Um, so you see that the drift becomes more negative the further you go to the left, and the drift becomes more positive the further you go to the right. So it means that interest rates on the interest rate curve are going down, drifting down, as stronger when they are further away from the point where the numerea sits and the interest rate goes up, drifting up yeah, if it is further in the future. So that means the interest rate curve is actually becoming tilted. Okay, so if we look at this picture yeah, and make this assumption that all the sigmas are the same, yeah, so which means that I have here just some term sigma squared. Okay. Then you see I have here a plus, here a minus. So the curve is becoming steeper over time. Well, that's a strange effect in my model. Okay, the curve is becoming steeper over time. The curve starts to rotate. Um, this effect that the curves become steeper actually comes from the equivalent martingale measure that imposes that my bond prices, my relative prices are martingales. Why? Yeah, because the bond um, includes some Product. So this product means that I pay interest on interest. 
So when you have a stochastic component paying interest on interest, yeah, this is like an exponential to the to the something. Yeah, this will generate a drift just out of this non-linearity that you pay interest on interest. If this thing has to be drift-free, so it has no drift, then this thing has to have a negative drift to compensate for this. So it's really an effect of the equivalent Martingale measure. Under the objective measure, under the P measure, the effect may not be present and actually likely it will not be present. Yeah, why? The difference between the equivalent Martingale measure and the objective measure is the market price of risk. And a bond that has a longer maturity has, of course, a much stronger risk with respect to interest rate. Because if interest rate move, it's not just, just linear because I pay interest on interest, it's non-linear. So it has a larger uh, risk. So maybe the market price of risk will be larger. So that will be exactly the drift part that maybe makes the forward rate drift less under the objective measure, but then the bond will have a drift. Also recall that our measure Q is just the thing to solve the equation for the replication portfolio. Yeah, So it came up that under the measure Q, it is much nicer, much easier to determine the value of the replication portfolio because if these things here are martingales, yeah, the linear combination of the martingale is a martingale too. So I can immediately use this to value the financial product. Apart from this, the equivalent martingale measure is a completely artificial thing. And under this measure, the interest rate curve appears to start this yeah, tilting that it becomes steeper. And there is a danger in this. If I have a one factor model, so one factor model means that my correlation is one. So I'm in the situation which I have just depicted. Then I have that these models ex exhibit this uh, effect. Yeah. So the model is maybe missing some scenarios. Yeah. So all the curves are becoming steeper. There's no curve that is declining over time when you start with a flat curve. So if I know, for example, that some bank is using a one-factor model, and actually there are ways to, to um, get some knowledge about which model they use, yeah? and we already know maybe about these ways, because the other bank has to pay collateral, and the collateral is determined by valuing the financial product. So by looking at the collateral, they are offering, I know a little bit how they value the financial product. So if I know, for example, a colleague comes to me and say, okay, I know that the bank is using a one factor model, then I know that they have a model in which all the interest rates curve are becoming steeper, but the other scenario is not included. So this is dangerous if you then value certain financial products, for example, the financial product that pays the difference of two forward rates. Yeah? Yeah. The difference of the two forward rate, I'm, I'm doing a finite difference. I'm doing it, taking, taking the slope out of the model. Yeah? And if they have the wrong model, well, maybe they get a wrong value for this financial product. Let me conclude by just showing you that this really exists, okay? So um, we will, in the next sessions, create a Monte Carlo simulation of this model. I have a visualization of this here. And this here is now um, a visualization of a one-factor model where I simulate a flat forward rate. So, and if I simulate the flat forward rate, one factor means all the forward rates make parallel movements. But if you look very closely, the parallel movements will also introduce some steepening. And the steepening becomes larger if the volatility that was accumulated, the sigma term is larger, 
also consistent with our drift. So you see all curves are having this shape. They started flat and they became steeper. If you change back here to a three factor model, uh, so now the model has more freedom. The correlation structure is not tied to one. Then I also have, if I now allow correlation here, different movements. Okay, so I allow here decorrelation. Yeah, so now the row, row parameter is not equal one. So I have now uh, different movements in my curve. And you see there's also a curve that goes down. Yeah, we also have a downward sloping curve. Such a model is maybe much better. Yeah, also going back to this remark here, this defect, all the one factor short rate models have this defect. Okay, so we have that. Um, we see an upward slope under QN if we look at this one-factor model. That was it for today. Thanks.